Our next and last speaker will be Dr. Sid Descupta from Kentucky State University. And he's going to talk about the economic analysis of, paddlefi of a paddlefish hatchery in Kentucky. All right. Okay. Um, you know, we, we talked a lot about paddlefish today. One thing we have to always remember that this is an aquaculture meeting, and aquaculture certainly is a business. Um, and we talked about different products that can be sold from paddlefish. Uh, but one of the weakest link of this paddlefish chain is the availability of um, seed stock or availability of fingerling paddlefish, um, which is really at the beginning. So, what I was this was actually a project uh, for uh, William Remmel. You see his name of, up there. He he is one of my graduate students, and this this is his uh, master's thesis. So we're going to um, jump right into it. Uh, let's see. Okay. The plan of this presentation is to show you the cost of produ production of phase two fingerling paddlefish, which are basically paddlefish that are about 150 to 200 grams. And these phase two paddlefish are eating. Uh, the floating pellets, the channel catfish floating pellets. Uh, we start by giving you a, a um, schematic of the production stages in a paddlefish hatchery and nursery. Uh, the spawning happens roughly by the middle of April, uh, after which the fish, um, you know, the, the young fish hatch from the eggs and they remain as a yolk sac fry for a, roughly a week, I think. Uh, that is that week allows a hatchery the opportunity of selling some of the yolk sac fry. So in our model, we look at the possibility of selling yolk sac fry. But those that are not sold are eventually get on eating Daphne as a live food, and they stay in that stage for roughly a month. After which they, they are uh, trained on feed pellets. Uh, they're given a high protein uh, trout starter diet. Uh, and this is what is called a phase one fingerling, okay? Um, they remain on the trout starter diet for roughly, a, for roughly two months. And then we call them phase two when they start eating the catfish diet, uh, which is significantly cheaper. Uh, the phase two fingerlings are available for sale uh, in uh, September or October of the same year of spawning. What we, are, what we are trying to do here is look at the possibility of using these uh, decommissioned reclaimed water treatment plant that Raphael spoke and, and showed photos about, uh, using them as a paddlefish hatchery and nursery and looking at what are the potential impacts of, uh, of leasing these plants on the cost of producing paddlefish. Uh, this is a growth curve of paddlefish, and uh, we, uh, we got this data from uh, Mike Wilhelm's thesis um, and used that to determine the, f uh, the amount of feed that we put in on a daily basis. Uh, clearly, in a hatchery economics, you're looking at a significant data load. Uh, you're looking at information related to survival rates because there are multiple life stages the fish go through, the various survival rate data. We are also looking at data associated with stocking uh, the fish uh, because the fish are thinned out, obviously, as, they, as they're getting bigger, and, and feeding rate data. Uh, some of this data is primary data that uh, uh, Remmel has collected uh, during his thesis research, and some of it is secondary data from Dr. Mims and Shelton and others uh, over, over a period of time. All these data were accumulated into a mathematical model, um, and uh, I, I rather not go into the details of the model, I'll just describe it. Uh, in general terms now, if you want details, I'll be only happy to oblige later. Uh, the model initially started out as what is called a linear programming model, the goal being maximizing the profit of a hatchery through one season. Uh, the 
hatchery managers' choices are to determine the number of yolk sac fry to sell or the number of phase two fingerlings to sell. I think that uh, phase one fingerlings are really not a product right now from these hatcheries. I think it's either yolk sac fry or phase two fingerlings. Uh, there are certain constraints in the model which are fairly easy to describe, two types of constraints. One being uh, the biological constraints of the smaller fish getting bigger and they're going through these mortalities as, as they spend more time in the water. And the second is the general water resource constraints because fishes need a certain stocking density at different uh, life stages which require a certain volume of water. Now, the, this, this linear programming model was overlaid later with a, uh, with a model where some of those parameters were made uncertain. And when these parameters were uncertain, for example, survival rate is, is a very uncertain parameter. And I had multiple observations of survival rate at different life stages from some of the research Steve Mims had done. And then we can use that as an empirical probability distribution and then we look and we develop a what is called a Monte Carlo simulation. What it does, it goes into this linear programming model and it selects survival rates uh, randomly along this empirical distribution and runs the model over and over again for 500 times. Okay, but we I, I actually ought to do it a thousand times minimum, but I did 500 because I was running out of time and WES was coming fast. Uh, but we we will do we will do it a lot more before before all these things go out to to the journal. But what happens is that by doing a Monte Carlo simulation, you get 500 uh, results for the, the optimization plan. How many paddlefish to, how many phase two paddlefish to sell? Uh, what is the uh, break-even price of phase two paddlefish? And from those 500 observations, clearly you can, you can build yourself a probability distribution, which will tell you, you know, with 90% probability, what is, you know, the boundary within which the break-even prices are going to be in, in any given year based on past data, okay? All right. Now, so initially I'm going to talk about the uh, results of the mean version of the model. By mean, by that, what, I, what I'm trying to say is looking at averages instead of standard deviations of model parameters. We looked at a, uh, a, one of the very base models where we are just de dealing with one brood female. What I wanted to point out, the, the whole purpose of the slide is, to, is for me to show you that just to take care of the babies coming out of this one female, we need 2.84, almost three tons of trout feed and over 13 tons of catfish feed. Uh, you can imagine if you have multiple brood females, okay, the tremendous demand for feed, okay? And this can be very simply ex expressed in a pie chart where you look at the operating costs and 79% of your operating cost is feed. So the cost of growing these paddlefish is entirely seem primarily driven by the, the price of feed. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, labor is the next next item, it's only 12%. Okay, and we charge labor at, at $12 an hour represent, uh, representing skilled labor as opposed to unskilled labor. Now, we talked about fixed costs quite, quite a bit in, uh, in previous presentations uh, this afternoon. Um, one of the beauties of using these decommissioned reclaimed water treatment plant is that the manager or the owner is just leasing the facility. There is no land or, f uh, e land or facility cost. It's primarily equipment cost that they have to, they have to incur. And, and mostly what the equipment they need is the equipment for live fish hauling and uh, some uh, you know, water quality equipment such as uh, pumps and aerators and DO meters and, and, and things like that. So this fixed cost for the London uh, uh, reclaimed water treatment plant of $12,000 per year you know, is a very paltry amount you know, when you compare to a, the fixed costs associated with a commercial fish hatchery. <coughs> And, and that is really 
part, the main part of this story that we are trying to tell you about using these reclaimed uh, water treatment plants as, as, a, as a commercial fish production center, okay? Anyway, I'm going to keep going because I don't think I have a whole lot of time. Um, I'm going to give you some results here, some very basic results uh, associated with the, the break-even prices of producing face to fingerlings. We we're looking at three uh, of the reclaimed water treatment plants that uh, we, we are using uh, in, in the state of Kentucky and in the region. And one is, the smallest one is the Cincinnati plant. Uh, this one has only two tanks, uh, each 100,000 100, gallons of 378,000 liter tanks. Uh, a larger plant is the one in London, Kentucky, uh, with, uh, with not only, uh, now they have 400,000 gallon tanks, but in addition to that, two 200,000 gallon tanks. The Winchester plant that Dr. Mims was uh, showing you photos about, it, it, is, it is definitely a larger plant, uh, however, it has several smaller tanks, such as uh, six uh, 15,000 gallon tanks, which, and, and you, you will see the impact of these different tank sizes on the cost of production. Notice that although the Cincinnati plant has much smaller water volume, uh, the break-even prices of paddlefish between Cincinnati and London are quite comparable. Can you see that? Okay, see, it's just actually the one in London is costing more, and and there are uh, there are there are two reasons for that, and one reason being that if you are limiting the number of fish uh, that you're producing, if you have a bound set on the number of fish you're producing, obviously a larger plant is going to cost more because because a larger plant has more money invested in it in fixed cost and operating cost and more money is going is being distributed to the same number of face to fingerlings that you're producing an interesting observation from this slide is that if if the farmer were to sell just uh, yolk sac fry they need to have a price above six cents a head on the yolk sac fry and we will we will visit that soon uh, another thing is that obviously as the plant sizes increase, so does the production capacity. In the production capacity of this uh, Cincinnati plant, based on the numbers that were given to me, uh, is about 105,000 uh, 105, fish, but with uh, the London plant, you, have 100, you can service up to 378,000 phase two uh, fingerlings. This is an interesting graph because this says, how much do I have? Two minutes, okay, I'll wrap it up. This, this graph, what it shows you here is that the minimum price of uh, your uh, yolk sack fry that is necessary for a farmer to sell yolk sack fry instead of face to fingerlings, okay? So we see that if your face to fingerling prices are varying from 60 cents to a dollar, you would require a minimum price of 20 cents or better for your yolk sack fry, which is, which is rather unlikely, which kind of, uh, which, which really illustrates the fact that the face to fingerlings are the more profitable uh, item here. Uh, as opposed to yolk sack fry, although you can recover your cost of production on yolk sack fry, uh, provided you sell it above six cents, uh, uh, six cents uh, a unit. These are some of the results on the Monte Carlo simulation that I was talking about, rerunning the model 500 times, and each time we are, we are uh, uh, randomly selecting from various probability distributions of production parameters and price parameters. We see for the Cincinnati plant, about 64% of the time, the cost of producing face to finger links is around 50 cents. 3% of the time, the cost of producing is around 40 cents a fish, okay? So, so you know, the implications are obvious from here, okay? That, that depending on, irrespective of, you know, you, of the, uh, changes in changes in prices and the changes in, uh, in survival over over period over the years. These are where your 
uh, your expected costs lie between these two regions, so about between 40 cents to 50 cents a fish. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to uh, conclude now. The main conclusion, in spite of what I have written there, the main conclusion is that this work that I'm presenting is, is very incomplete. And the reason it is incomplete is what I stated earlier. Uh, we have no real handle on the market for yolk sac fry and the market for uh, phase two fingerlings. Unless we can characterize that, the best that any economist can do is really identify the production cost on these te new technologies, okay? Now, profit, can, we cannot discuss profit at this point because we do not know what we can sell and how much we can sell. However, what, we can, what I can tell you is that there might be a possibility of these phase two fingerlings that are, that are about half a pound uh, being sold for human consumption. There might be a possibility there, okay? Uh, and definitely they can be used for reservoir ranching, stockers for reservoir ranching, or for stockers for intensive meat production later. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop now, and do you have any questions?